Hey guys, thanks for watching this one. It's been a little bit since I've been able to get a video out. Uh, life happened and my dad got unexpectedly sick and passed away. And we just buried him yesterday. So today my thoughts are wrapped up in him. And uh, my dad was a really good storyteller. He was a pastor like I am. And I know that Especially being a, being a kid, listening to a pastor can be a little difficult. But if you run across one that's a good storyteller, it makes a difference. We didn't even have a TV when I was real little. And I have a lot of memories of my dad and my uncle sitting on a front porch telling a story. And I think that gene's been passed on to a few of us in the family. So I haven't felt a whole lot like getting out and looking for anything. But one way I do clear my mind is by doing genealogy or just reading some old history. And I ran across a really good story a few months back, actually. Been kicking around making a video of it. It's a story from World War II that I encountered in an old newspaper, and it's about two brothers that were Marine Air Corps pilots, Robert and Wallace Wilhide. Their story is worth telling. I hope you enjoy this one. The U.S. troops stationed around Okinawa in 1945 had a serious problem on their hands. That problem's name was Betty. Betty was the name given to a night-flying Japanese bomber. Why was it called Betty? Well, all Japanese bombers were named after women, and Betty is rumored to be a Pennsylvania waitress. But we may never know for sure. Betty was wreaking havoc on the U.S. troops, bombing airfields, troops, ships, anything that it could hit, and nothing was stopping it. So, the services of Colonel Marion Magruder were called into play, and he arrived with his VMF-533 Black Max Killers. It was a group of night fighters flying the Grumman Hellcat. One of those pilots was a young lieutenant by the name of Robert Wilhide. He was handpicked along with 15 other pilots, and when they arrived in Okinawa on May 10th, it only took them 36 hours, and they were officially combat ready. At 1.30 a.m. on May 16th, Lieutenant Robert Wilhide climbed into his Grumman Hellcat, parked on Yontan Airfield. He was joined by Colonel Marion Magruder and four other pilots, each man preparing to fly a pie-shaped piece of a grid in which it was their job to find and destroy the Betty Bomber. As he took off into the night sky, there was nothing to see, only the dim light of his instrument panel in his plane. At 3 a.m., his radio crackled to life, and the radio controller from the ground that was assigned specifically to him and his aircraft, alerted him that there was an enemy in his sector. The radar controller began to vector Lieutenant Wilhide towards the incoming Japanese bomber. At 3 a.m., Lieutenant Wilhide snuck up on his target. The only thing that he could see as he came in below the bomber was the black shape of the bomber blotting out the stars in the distance. Lieutenant Wilhide closed to within 100 feet before squeezing the trigger and opening fire with his six 50 caliber machine guns. The left side engine was the first to go before he transitioned to the other side of the bomber and took out the right side. Just a moment later, Lieutenant Wilhide's voice was heard coming across the radio waves. He said, splash, one Betty. Lieutenant Robert Wilhide was the very first of Black Max killers to take out a night-flying Japanese bomber. The following evening on May 17th, Robert Wilhide once again climbed into his Grumman Hellcat. He was comforted by two thoughts. One, he was not alone in this fight. His younger brother, Wallace Wilhide, was also a Marine Air Corps pilot. They were very close, having graduated high school and college together, and now they were serving their country together. Wallace was stationed nearby, and they had a chance to actually get together for just a short minute. Wallace took to the skies during the day, and it was his job to fight it out with the Japanese fighters. 
The second comforting thought came from the plane itself. A twist of fate had united Robert with a very special Grumman Hellcat. Just beneath the cockpit, in white letters, were the words donated by the people of Andrews, North Carolina. That was Robert's hometown, nestled in the mountains of western North Carolina. Perhaps his own mother and father had donated money for this plane, and he was not prepared to let their sacrifice go to waste. As he climbed into the night skies, it wasn't long before his radar operator informed him that there was an enemy in his sector, and as Robert closed the distance, he was surprised to find not one, but two Japanese Bettys flying through the night sky above him. Robert closed the distance as before and prepared to fire his machine guns when suddenly the night sky around him erupted in anti-aircraft fire. Robert had unknowingly flown into a no-fly zone surrounding a U.S. warship. Not knowing that there was a U.S. pilot in the air, the warship opened fire and Robert's plane was hit and went down. He was never heard from again and his body was not recovered. It was just a few days later that his brother Wallace Wilhide took to the skies with a heavy heart, having heard of the loss of his brother Robert. He closed in behind a Japanese Zero and unleashed destruction with his machine guns. And his voice was heard over the radio to say, this one is for you, Bob. Unfortunately, Wallace, too, would also die in this war. Just a few days later, and less than a month after his brother died, Wallace was shot down, and he, too, was never recovered. Frank and Maud Wilhide of Andrews, North Carolina, had lost both of their sons in this war. Just a reminder of the incredibly high price of freedom. Whenever I tell these stories, if at all possible, I like to visit a cemetery. If I can stand at the foot of a grave of somebody whose story I've told, it kind of closes things out for me. I like to pay my respects in person, so to speak. This is the Valleytown Cemetery in Andrews, North Carolina, and I had been here for over an hour because I'd heard that the Wilhide brothers had a memorial here erected by their mother. I just couldn't find it, so I'd given up. And last minute, I decided to visit a couple other graves that mean quite a bit to me. My wife had an aunt and uncle that were very dear to us, Bryant and Sandra Jackson. And they died not too recently. And Bryant also is a veteran of Vietnam. But as I stood here at their graves, remembering them, I noticed a headstone, a marker, at the foot of their graves. I decided to take a look at it, and there it is. Will Hyde. When Sandra and Bryant were buried, I didn't know this story, and so it didn't catch my eye, but there's the memorial that their mother erected in their memory. When I tell these stories, my hope is always that I'm helping to keep keep their story alive a little bit. And my greatest fear is that I don't do a good job at it. And, and maybe these stories and these people will eventually just kind of be lost to history. And so it's very, very rewarding when that proves to be not the case. What's really amazing about this entire story is what happened the very next morning. I turned on my phone and there was a Facebook post from the Andrews Chamber of Commerce about a memorial dedication at Freedom Memorial Plaza. And this memorial, it's for the Wilhide brothers. It turns out they're not nearly as forgotten as what I thought. So I decided, even though I couldn't stay for the memorial service itself, that I would get there a little bit early. 
and take a look at this monument that had been erected in their honor. Now, it sometimes happens, dates and, and events can get, well, a little bit lost in history, but that's okay. What matters is, these two boys are not forgotten, and their sacrifice is not forgotten, and this little small town in western North Carolina, well, the Wilhide brothers mattered to them, and their memory lives on right here in the mountains where they grew up.